Good morning, guys, and uh, welcome to Choice City Church. My name is Jeremy. I'm a pastor here at Choice City, and uh, really glad to be here this morning and gather with you guys. And uh, I feel like this church family is um, as near and dear to my heart as any church family has ever been to me. So I'm very glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, during the Advent season, Advent, you might remember, is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas um, on the church calendar. And so we're in the second week of Advent. And we're going to, uh, at least this week, continue working through the book of John, um, finishing up the, the paragraph that we've been in, starting in verse 16 and working down through verse 21. And uh, I'm going to try, try to tailor some things so that uh, we, as we think about uh, the coming of Christ, we're mindful of what Christ has accomplished. This passage just says some awesome things about what Christ has done. So I think this is a fitting place to stay, at least this week, for uh, the Advent season. Um, if you're not there already, go ahead and, and turn to John chapter 3. Um, we're uh, in this great conversation the midst of a great conversation uh, between Jesus and Nicodemus. And actually, it's, there's some question. I talked about this a little bit last week. Are we still in the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus? Or is this John's commentary following up the conversation? And uh, I tend to think it's John's commentary. The translators of the ESV have it in red letters, so they think it's Jesus. Probably you should go with them um, rather than me. Uh, but... Um, Whatever the case may be, we've got this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus happening at least through the first 15 verses. And then either Jesus or Nicodemus now gives a commentary, uh, especially following verses 14 and 15. Read those verses with me. Verse 14 of chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, uh, so, all, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, verses 16 to 21 reflect on this idea that the Son of Man uh, must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And that reflection begins with verse 16. Go ahead and read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we walked through this uh, verse last week, and, and what we saw last week was, was that God has an intense and gracious love for the world, and that's what lies behind the giving of his son. And, and in this verse, the definition of love is all important. The way that you think of uh, God's love for the world is, is all important for understanding this verse. We ought not think of God's love for the world in terms of God's praise for the world. Like, I love you so much, you're so beautiful, uh, I, essentially exalting the value, the intrinsic value of the world. That's kind of missing the point, actually, of what, what uh, is being said here. Instead, we have to think of God's love as a gracious love for a broken world that can't help itself. And so God so deeply feels compassion for the world that he sends his son and the goal of the gift of the Son is to rescue us from the death that we deserve and to give us an eternity of life together with him, knowing, knowing him. In other words, uh, Jesus was sent to bring salvation, would be the word that we uh, talk about. Uh, John himself even uses the word <clears throat> save in verse 17. Uh, and so we're talking about salvation, and today what I want to do is provide further definition of what that salvation consists of, and in particular, we're going to see two features of our salvation in the rest of this paragraph. There are probably more features to salvation than just these two things, but I want to highlight a couple things that I'm seeing here um, so that uh, as we understand the salvation that Christ brings, we might more fully appreciate the gift of Jesus this Christmas. We can see uh, more fully the wonders of God's love, as we talked about last week, the wonders of God's love as we look at Jesus, mindful of the salvation that he came to purchase for us. The first feature of our salvation that I want to look at this morning is what uh, I'm going to call our justification. And the second feature of our salvation that I want to talk about this morning is what I'm going to call our transformation. Okay, so John 3, 16, you believe in order to not perish but have eternal life. 
And then in verse 17, a little follow-up comment on that. Verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So here we see the first feature, the first feature of, the, of the salvation that Jesus purchased that we're going to look at this morning in this paragraph. And in order to explain this feature of salvation, uh, John, or Jesus, uses the imagery of God's heavenly courtroom. God's heavenly courtroom, which is a, a fairly uh, common type of imagery for a, a biblical author to use. Sometimes an uh, author will use different kinds of imagery to talk about the relationship between God and man. Sometimes it's, it's king and subjects. Sometimes it's father and children. Sometimes it's shepherd and sheep. Uh, sometimes it's husband and bride, and sometimes it's judge and uh, what accused. Um, that would be or or judge and uh, the people on trial. I don't know, Dustin. What, what would you call that? I don't know. People on trial. Yeah. The accused. Okay. So. Um, that's what you got. That's the imagery. And, and, and the, the way that the courtroom typically worked in the Israelite mentality is going to be pretty intuitive uh, for us. Um, you've got the person who's on trial. And this person has either acted uh, righteously or unrighteously with regards to whatever the issue is that they're on trial for. for. And therefore, they have a record of uh, righteousness. Or unrighteousness, depending on whether or not they are uh, uh, they've performed in accordance with the law. Um, so you've got uh, a person who acts righteous. The person who acts righteous has righteousness and is therefore uh, regarded as righteous. And you have the person who's acted unrighteous and has therefore a record of unrighteousness. And we think of this as an unrighteous person or a wicked person. Those would be the kinds of labels that would be used. That's what you have with uh, the... Uh, person on trial, the accused, and the judge then looks at the record. And of course, when God is the judge, he has 20-20 vision, he looks at the record, the record of righteousness or the record of unrighteousness, and on the basis of the record of righteousness or unrighteousness, the judge then delivers a verdict. And there are two possible verdicts. Righteousness yields this verdict, you are declared righteous. On the basis of your righteousness. So the righteous person is declared to be righteous on the basis of their righteousness. That's pretty intuitive. That makes sense. Um, the word that would be used for this sometimes, especially in uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul, um, but not exclusively, would be the word justified. To be justified is to receive a positive verdict in the courtroom of God, or in a courtroom. To be justified is to be declared righteous. Uh, the other verdict that you would get, uh, if the judge looks, and, the, and, and God as judge has 20-20 vision, he looks at your record of unrighteousness, and on the basis of your righteousness, he declare, of your unrighteousness, he declares you to be guilty. So you've got the not guilty verdict, and you've got the guilty verdict. The, the one, the positive verdict, uh, would also be known as being justified, and the negative verdict would be known as being condemned. Okay, does that make sense? you got two possible verdicts. The verdicts are uh, given by the judge. It's a declaration of what your status now is based upon the record of, uh, of work that you've done, whether righteous or unrighteous. And then based upon your verdict, if it's a positive verdict, uh, if you're justified, declared righteous, then there's usually uh, some sort of reward or, uh, or, or blessing that goes with that. I mean, for one thing, you just get to walk free, right? Um, blessing goes with those who are justified, and curse goes with those who are condemned. There's some sort of punishment that comes on the heels of the verdict, right? That's pretty intuitive. That makes sense. Um, uh, uh, it's a pretty straightforward understanding of the courtroom in Jewish thought. I'll give you an example of this. You can see it in 1 Kings chapter 8. Verse 32, Solomon is at the temple. You don't have to turn there, uh, but you may want to write it down. Solomon is at the temple. He's dedicating the temple, and he's praying to God, and he says, 
here in heaven, God, and act and judge your servants. There's going to be a judgment here. I want you to, God, please assess us and render a judgment. Condemning the wicked, a verdict for the wicked, by bringing his way on his own head. So on the basis of the, of the unrighteous life and on the basis of the wicked life, bring a verdict that accords with the, uh, the basis. Does that make sense? Condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. So you've lived a life of righteousness Therefore, you are a righteous person, and therefore, in the courtroom of God, may you be justified. May you be found not guilty. Make sense? Uh, verdict uh, on the basis of the life lived. And um, in light of all of that, I want you to read one more time with me verses 17 and 18 of John chapter 3. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Okay, there's a, that's a, that's a verdict type of language. He didn't come to give the negative verdict. But, in order that the world might be saved through him. He's, he's rescuing them from the verdict. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Okay, the idea here is they are justified instead. They're not receiving the negative verdict. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Verdict's already been rendered because he's not believed in the name of the Son of God. Jesus didn't come for the purpose of pronouncing a guilty verdict. That's what's meant in verse 17 by God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. That wasn't the, that wasn't the thrust uh, of his mission. Verse 16 made that clear. Uh, that, that God has come, sent his son to, to rescue the world from death and to give eternal life. But verse 17 is now making that even more clear. The thrust of his mission is not to bring the condemning verdict. He has another agenda. We'll look at that in just a minute. But first, I just want to reflect on this, this condemnation verdict a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the default verdict over humanity in the heavenly courtroom. Um, it already hangs over the world, um, and natural humanity is already under this verdict. Uh, by nature, due to a few things, like one, Adam is our representative. That's, people are born in Adam, we might say, or under Adam. Uh, Adam is our representative, the, the big Big dog theologians refer to this as to uh, Adam's federal headship. Um, uh, Adam is the one who was acting uh, on your behalf in the garden. He represents you. So much so that in Romans 5.12, Paul says that um, when Adam sinned, you sinned. He says, though you were there, um, it, it counts that much for you. So by virtue of our incorporation into Adam, we are guilty in the courtroom. Not only that, but we've also inherited from Adam a disease, a sin disease. A sinful DNA it dwells within our hearts. So not only like do we do sinful things, we are sinners. We are sinful. It's part of who we are who we are deep within the soul. So we're incorporated to Adam, and he failed. On top of that, I'm diseased with sin. On top of that, I actually practice sin. So guilty, guilty, guilty. Like, uh, this is not a good situation in the courtroom of God, and that's what is meant by uh, verse 18. Whoever does not believe is condemned already. That that already indicates that this is the con this is the verdict that all, that is already in place over the world. When God sent His Son uh, into the world, He didn't send His Son into a, a neutral world, right? He sends His Son into a condemned world. We had already been assessed, 
and uh, the verdict was already in uh, condemned. Those who don't believe are already, therefore, condemned. Before Jesus even shows up on the scene, the, verdicts, the verdict is already in. Um, and not only have we already received the verdict, but because uh, the verdict is uh, already in, there is also a resulting punishment that's imminent, uh, a punishment that's on its way. And John has already told us uh, in part, what that punishment in uh, what that punishment is in verse sixteen, um, it's death. That's what the guilty verdict secures. That's the compensation we might say for uh, the guilt uh, in the courtroom. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. So the guilty verdict um, is followed by a death sentence. Right? If we want to stay in the courtroom language. Uh, that's one way of describing the punishment that falls on the guilty verdict. John actually has a more descript way of describing the punishment that falls on the uh, heels of the guilty verdict in chapter 3, verse 36. If you want to drop, drop your eyes down there, John says that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Very similar type of language here. Um, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So not only does condemnation remain, not only does the, the verdict remain, but now the punishment, the imminent punishment of the, the follow-up, the, the wrath that is due to those who are condemned. Um, so death sentence, wrath of God, these are both the punishment, the explanations of the punishment that falls upon uh, the condemned. And all of that is just to describe that this is the default situation of the world. That's just the, that's the given of the world. We are condemned in the courtroom of God and facing the impending wrath of God. And what I want us to see is that John is telling us that Jesus did not come to pronounce that verdict. Verse 17. <clears throat> I can find it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That verdict is already in place when Jesus comes. Jesus didn't need to come in order to make that verdict happen. It was already, it was already there. The thrust of his ministry in the context of this discussion was to resolve that legal issue. Um, so that we don't face the consequences. He comes to alleviate the guilty verdict in God's courtroom, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, verse 17, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. If you're not condemned, it means, therefore, that you have, rather than being found guilty in the courtroom, you've been found not guilty in the courtroom, or to use Paul's language or language that's elsewhere used in the New Testament, you've been justified. You've been justified in the courtroom of God. Uh, God sends Jesus not to condemn the already condemned world. He sends Jesus so that you can be justified in the courtroom. And if you're justified, then your punishment has been alleviated. Death has been alleviated. The wrath of God has been removed. We're saved from our verdict, and therefore we're saved from the punishment. We're saved from the wrath of God. Now, who is that not guilty verdict granted to? Who's it granted to? Take a look in verse 18. Who is it granted to? It's a real, it's a real question. I'm, I'm waiting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> whoever believes, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in Jesus does not receive that verdict in the courtroom. John, more than any other gospel, wants to emphasize the crucial role that faith plays in the Christian life, or belief. He uses the verb to believe over... Uh, over 80 times, 85 times in, in uh, his book. And uh, in this passage, he's telling us that believing in Jesus is the key to being rescued from the damning verdict. Right? Believing is the key to being rescued from condemnation. Notice that this does not follow the ordinary rules of the courtroom. Because uh, in, in the courtroom, ordinarily, who is pronounced not guilty. Who? 
the innocent. And to use, to use uh, the biblical language, the, the righteous. Ordinarily, it's the righteous who are, who are justified. Um, in this case, however, it is people um, from the world. This world, Don, John's defined it pretty, pretty gruesomely for us, or he will here in a few minutes. Um, uh, it's people from the world who are pronounced righteous, or in the words of Paul in Romans 4 or 5, God justifies the ungodly. Think about that. God pronounces not guilty the ungodly. That's not ordinary. So it's not as though Jesus comes into the world to save the, those who deserve to be saved. Uh, deserve to be saved. He comes to, to save genuinely worldly people. <laughs> Uh, he comes to provide justification for the ungodly. And he breaks the rules of what is ordinary in God's courtroom in order to provide something that is extraordinary, the not guilty verdict for people who are actually in practice quite guilty. Um, and God did that because he, know, he knows that we can't resolve this legal issue. You cannot resolve this legal issue on your own. Our, our own works, our own record, is only going to ever render one verdict, and it is the condemnation verdict. Uh, you can't depend on your record. You can't resolve to make your record better. Uh, you will always be found guilty in the courtroom of God so long as you are trusting in uh, your own works. And so God sends Christ, and he, he, he invites us to look away from ourselves, look away from your record, and look to Jesus for salvation. Put your faith in a Savior who performs on your behalf what you have failed to perform. God does demand righteousness in order for there to be a, a justif justification verdict. He demands righteousness. It's just that we can't provide it. So he sends Jesus who provides a record for us. Jesus provides a perfect record of righteousness, and he takes upon himself our record. You see, there's a, there's a, there's a, a swapping of records. And, and what, 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 what my record was filled with, all the filth, was imputed to his account, and his record was imputed to my account, and so we stand in the courtroom of God, me and Jesus, right? And... Uh, and the father looks at me, and he says, not guilty. And he looks at Jesus, and what does he say? Guilty. And Jesus is condemned. Jesus is condemned because of my record. And I am justified because of his record. This is what it means to be justified by faith. Um, or to use John's language, to be not condemned by belief. Uh, John and Paul are talking about the same, same things. Uh, this is more commonly associated with Paul, Paul's justification, a doctrine of justification by faith alone, apart from works. Uh, but here, this is what we're talking about here. And, and the Father knows you can't provide it, so he provides it for you. So that by looking away from your own record, you look at Jesus, his righteousness is yours, your sin becomes him uh, because he becomes his. And he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, which is just beautiful, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? Um, not on the basis of your work. So this is the first feature of the salvation that Jesus provides uh, that this passage is illuminating for us. And I, and I want us to reflect on this, and I want us to enjoy this as we prepare our hearts for Christmas this year. Uh, I, I want you to think about the gift of your verdict in heaven in the coming weeks. I want you to think about the gift of your not guilty verdict. Jesus came to give that to you. So he doesn't want us swimming around in condemnation. We're probably all going to taste the reality of our failures uh, in the weeks to come. Okay, Your failures as a mom, 
And your failures as an employer, your failures as a money manager, I'm not advocating it, it just tends to happen this time of year. Our failures as uh, joyful Christmas shoppers, your failures as a child, your failures as a sibling, you can count on it, right? We're going to fall short. And uh, we're going to taste the reality behind why we actually deserve the guilty verdict. You might feel, you might feel that. I actually deserve that verdict. Um, and then our enemy, uh, the accuser by name, uh, is going to launch into a very convincing case uh, for why you are a failure and why God hates you and uh, why you're not the Christian that you're supposed to be, and it's going to leave you feeling condemned. Um, your flesh and the enemy are uh, very good at providing uh, a sense of condemnation uh, for our souls. And the question I want to ask is, how are you going to battle when that happens? How are you going to battle? How are you going to battle against the sense of condemnation, which feels like a valid thing because of the reality that uh, you've sinned and Satan makes a good case? You, he's, he's, he just has to point out the reality of who we are and what we've done. And uh, how are you going to battle in that moment? How are you going to battle? And our tendency, this is our tendency, this is the tendency of my flesh, and yours as well, is to, is to then focus on um, your efforts to be a better mom, and your efforts to be a better employer, or a better employee, or a better money manager, or a more joyful Christmas shopper, or a better child to your parents, or a better sibling, um, but I just want to caution you against that because that's not where you start. You can't start there. Um, that doesn't lead to growth. That leads to self-righteousness. That's just, that's just, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. Just don't start. We do need to like make some adjustments, but I'm saying don't start with just trying to fix yourself. That's not where true Christian growth comes from. Here's what I want you to do. Here's, what I, here's where I want you to start. I want you to think about the gift of your verdict in heaven. I want you to battle the accuser's accusation by reminding him. And more importantly, by reminding yourself that Jesus came to give you the not guilty verdict. And therefore, despite the reality of your failure, your father has nevertheless received you, warts and all. This is how you're battling. My father has received me. And that his reception of me was not in the first place on the basis of my righteousness. It was on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus. And it stands true today. Just like it did at the very beginning. We came to faith and we believed in Jesus for a right standing before God. And now that we're Christians, we don't go back to a works model. We keep trusting that that verdict was stated once for all. That verdict never changes. Here's the thing. When you're justified in the courtroom of God, uh, it doesn't rise and fall with your good days and your bad days. You're either justified or you're not. And if you're trusting in Jesus, you're justified. And that never changes. Your verdict always stays the same. And therefore, while it is true that I have sinned and I have fallen short once again, it is not true that I stand condemned in the sight of God. And I confess my sins now to a merciful God. And I remember that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the reality. You may not feel it. That's why you need to talk to yourself. It's why you need to tell yourself about the reality. Start there. Camp there. 
The battle begins with belief. The battle begins with belief. Do you believe, do you believe that your Lord has given you a verdict of not guilty in his presence? Bask in your justification and may God lift your head. May God lift your heart. Um, that's the first feature of salvation that the gift of the Son provides for us as is laid out in this paragraph at least. Here's the second feature I want to talk about in this passage. It's buried at the end in verse 21, and I'm going to walk us through the rest of the argument before we get to verse 21, so you have to kind of hold on for a few minutes before we get to the second component of uh, salvation. Let's listen to the argument here in 3, 19 to 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Okay. This is actually a little confusing. We just learned in verses 17 and 18 that Jesus did not come to pronounce condemnation. Right? Jesus did not come to pronounce condemnation, but to relieve us from condemnation. And then somewhat confusingly, uh, at first at least, we read in verse 19 that as a result of Jesus coming into the world, a judgment has been reached. This is the judgment, verse 19. <laughs> Jesus did not come in the world to condemn the world. This is the judgment. So... <clears throat> Let's clarify this before we move on. What's going on? Did Je I mean, <laughs> did Jesus come to judge or not? Um, and the reason and John's making some clarifications here, he's, he, he knows that he's got to make some nuances because there's a sense in which uh, Jesus came to judge the world, and there's a sense in which Jesus did not come to judge the world. Clearly, there's a sense in which Jesus did not come to bring judgment, in that he does not declare a message of condemnation, Right? That's what verse 17 says. However, there is actually a type of judgment that arrives with Jesus as the light comes into the world in the sense that the presence of light, it exposes the hearts of the people on the earth. Uh, so in that sense, even though Jesus doesn't go around declaring a, a message of, of condemnation, his very presence reveals what lies within the hearts of those who uh, believe what lies within the hearts of those who do not believe. Uh, it reveals what's in the hearts of those who are under condemnation. And it reveals what's in the hearts of those who have been justified. In other words, we've already talked about what uh, happened in the heavenly courtroom in verses 17 and 18. Unbelievers are condemned. Believers are justified. Now, let's talk about what's going on inside of those people here on the earth. What's under what's underneath the hood of an unbeliever? What's underneath the hood of a believer? Um, and in that sense, Jesus does bring a certain type of judgment. His presence reveals the heart, and this is the judgment. Here's what the light exposes about the hearts of believers. Here's what the light exposes about the hearts of unbelievers. Um, let's talk about the heart of unbelievers first, because uh, that's what John does in verses 19 and 20. Check it out. Here's the judgment. This is the judgment. Um, here's what's in the heart. Here's what's under the hood. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. So when the light of Christ comes into the world, there are some people who act in ways that are perfectly consistent with whom the world has always been, right? <clears throat> there are some people who love the darkness, um, and they practice wickedness, John says here, and that's only natural for our sinful humanity, right? This is just talking about the natural, sinful, unbelieving humanity of the world. When the light shows up, they hate the light because it threatens to expose the wicked things that they have so long cherished. Now, we've all experienced this type of thing. I think just to kind of pull out the dynamic, I want to illustrate it um, with uh, uh, kind of an extreme example, I suppose. But, but here's the dynamic at work. Um, you have this love affair with something very dark, right? And then light threatens to expose it, 
and um, you you hate you hate the life for doing that. I'm thinking I'm thinking of of the the deep enslaving love that some people have for pornography, um, and uh, it it. It, it's a very, it's a very, very dark thing. And even people who are like enslaved to it, many of them, I would even say most of them, realize like this is not good. You could use any addiction. Right? You could talk about drug addiction, or you could talk about food addiction, or the addiction to being, being praised by others, or whatever. Um, I'm just using this as an as an example. It's a, it's a, it's a deep enslaving, enslaving love, like a passion, like I, I, like I, I want this so badly, and it's dark. And so people hide it, right? Nobody's out there wanting to be known as like the porn freak, right? Uh, people hide it. They don't want it to be seen. This is the kind of dynamic that is the trademark of the unbelieving world. Now, there are still pockets of that, of course, within our own lives. Because all we're talking about here is the, is the idolatrous dynamics of the heart. Um, we love things that we ought not love, and we don't want them to be taken away. So we still, as believers, because of indwelling sin, battle with this very uh, dynamic and some of those same issues. But my point here is, and John's point here, is that um, there is a, a dark passion, an enslaving passion, uh, that people are, are, are tied to, and they want it to stay hidden, and they don't want the light to... Expose it. And when the light comes into the world and unbelievers encounter Jesus, this is what people just naturally uh, naturally do. They're going to hate that light. They're going to hate the light of Christ. And um, because of that, um, they are not going to want to be exposed, or maybe that's why they hate the light. They don't want to be exposed, and they want to maintain their dark love affairs. Now, let's make sure we understand something here. Um, we're talking about the response of every single human being who does not trust in Jesus. This is just human nature uh, 101, and that means that this was you, and this was me. Um, and I don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget that we didn't do anything special to get out of that situation either. Um, we didn't, and we couldn't do anything to awaken our eyes to the beauty of the light. Uh, we were enslaved. We were slaves of sin. You can't break that slavery. You were dead in sin. You can't resurrect yourself. Um, and the only reason that we're not in that situation right now, for those of you who are trusting in Jesus, is because of what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus just a few verses earlier. Verses 1 through 8. Um, God has to perform a miraculous work in the heart, bringing us from death to life bringing us from a point of having no perceptivity to the reality of supernatural things to having a new birth. You have to be born again. This, is, this was the decisive act of God that rescued you from your enslavement to the darkness. He gave you a love for the light. He opened your eyes to see the light and gave you a love for the light. You can't produce that in yourself. This is why God is entirely uh, sovereign in the salvation of of human beings. You cannot turn on the lights. And when God turns on the lights, what he does is gives you a love for the glory of who he is. So you can't boast in this. You can take no credit for this. In fact, check it out. Um, flip back to first or to John chapter one. John chapter one, because John's already kind of brought this whole topic up for us. In verse 9, you'll see the parallel. John 1, 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Okay, that's the same thing that we're talking about in chapter 3. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Blind to him, uninterested in him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Okay? We reject him. We hate the light. This is everything that John's talking about in chapter 3. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. Now here, now we're talking about the same stuff. Belief. Um, what underlies the belief? Well, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, 
nor of the will of man, but of God. Until God sovereignly awakened us to his glory, and until the Spirit of God freely blew upon us like the wind, chapter 3, verse 8, we would not and we could not believe. And so this is us. This is, this is the old us, chapter 3, verses, uh, uh, verse 19 and 20. That's us when we're left to ourselves. That's what unbelief looks like when you pop open the hood. Um, it's lovers of darkness rather than the light. It's doers of wicked things. It's haters of the light. It's those who refuse to come to the light. And that's one response to the light. And then there's another response in verse 21. And uh, here we're going to finally see that second feature of salvation that I was talking about. Um, read verse 21 with me. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And this is, of course, a description of the heart of the believer and he or she responds to the light in actually a totally unexpected way. This is not how people from the world should respond to the light. Um, <clears throat> it's contrary to what you would um, think for, for, to happen in, when the light comes into the darkness-loving world. Believers, they actually come to the light. And um, we already know, as we just saw from chapter 1, so we know from earlier in the book, um, and even earlier in the chapter, as we saw in verses 1 through 8, the cause of this faith, it ultimately comes from God giving the new birth. And um, that God has done something in a believer. He's done something miraculous. He begins a work of transformation in their life. And it begins with that spiritual new birth. And it produces a faith. And that spirit-empowered faith then produces a transformed life of obedience to God. That's what happens. There's a transformation of the person's life, so that they have a life that, in verse 20, look at verse 21 of chapter 3, a life that does what is true. These people have been deeply, deeply changed. It starts with the new birth, it gives birth to belief, belief gives birth to a life of doing what is true. So the person who's been born again, and the person who believes in Jesus, begins now to follow Jesus, right? Begins now to o obey Jesus. We're not talking about perfect obedience, but we are talking about a notable change. This is one of the things, this is a second element of salvation uh, that Jesus has purchased for you. Uh, you change. Jesus can change you. How many people are investing how much money and how many resources trying to change, right? Right? change their bodies, change their outlook on life, change their... I know people who've changed their names, right, uh, to get a new identity. Um, Jesus can change you. And one of the blessings of salvation, one of the benefits, one of the features of the salvation that Jesus purchases for us is that he actually changes us so that we start to do what is true. It's not perfect obedience. It's just notable change. I remember hearing uh, uh, a scholar, D.A. Carson, one time receiving, uh, uh, giving an acceptance speech for uh, a book that was written in his honor, and uh, it was totally humbling for him, and uh, I just thought he had the most tactful uh, response I, I, I could have ever imagined, um, and it was some, some way of, of acknowledging that, that, like, wow, I have not, this is, like, not me. This is all the Lord, but you know what? Um, the, the Lord has actually uh, done quite work in my life. And, and so he says, he says, um, and this may not be verbatim, but he says, well, I am <clears throat> not what I should be. And I am certain not what I am. But I am most definitely not. Jesus changes people. When they're really saved, Jesus changes people. And that's a second feature of the salvation that has been purchased for us. When the Holy Spirit wakes you up to the beauty of the light of Christ, and Jesus begins to work in your life to change you into somebody that you can never be on your own. You're not perfect, but you're different. Because not only does the salvation that Jesus provides us 
Not only does the salvation that Jesus provides us with give us a new verdict in the courtroom, but our salvation also consists of an internal transformation that produces within our lives a new way of living, a trajectory of obedience. And though we can see it, we can't take credit for it, right? You can see it in your life, but you can't take credit for it. I can look at my life. I am not doing the things that I was doing when I didn't know Jesus. March 14th, 1997 was the last time I ever used illegal drugs because that was the day that I met Jesus. Um, I am not what I used to be. Um, not perfect, but I can see the change. And I want you to know what Jesus has done in my life. I want you to know that because I want him to get the glory. I know that for myself. He's given me a new birth. He's given me a new verdict. He started this change in us. It's all a work of grace. I know that it's a work of grace in my life. You know that it's a work of grace in your life. In our best moments, at least, we know that, right? Uh, we can tend to forget, and God does a good job of humbling us uh, to remind us. So what happens? What happens when this born-again, this faith-filled, this light, uh, life-transformed uh, person encounters the light of Christ. What is the principle at work in the life of a true believer when it comes to his or her interactions with Christ? Well, John tells us that when light is presented to believers, believers gravitate to the light. Unlike, unlike unbelievers who run from the light, believers gravitate to the light and they do so with eagerness to make it clear that everything about their transformation is a work of the grace of God. Read verse 21 one more time. Whoever does what is true, whoever's got a transformed life, whoever's been born again and is living differently, is a believer in Jesus, and is, and is walking now in a new path, not of perfection, but a trajectory of obedience, whoever does what is true, comes to the light. Why? So that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This person is living a life that has been transformed. He's eager to come to the light so that it will be clear that God is the one who is behind it all. It's a motivating factor for this person. I just want God's work to be seen. I want my works, I want it to be clearly seen that my works have been carried out in God. In other words, the believer comes to light because of and for the glory of God. The believer comes to the light because of what God has done in their life and so that God might get the glory for what he's done in their life. He does the work in us and we come to him with eagerness to get glory. So what's going on under the hood? in the life of a believer. What's going on under the hood is this. They come to the light with deep humility about themselves and great admiration for God. It's not me. I'm just eager for people to know what God did for me. That's what's under the hood. God's Son was sent into the world not to condemn us, but to give us a new verdict, a not guilty verdict. And for those who believe in him, they not only receive that free gift of justification in the courtroom, but they also receive a free gift of uh, transformed life. A life that is yet imperfect, but on its way to becoming nearly unrecognizable someday in its glorified state. And though we're not what we should be, and we are certainly not what we will be, and we are most... We are not what we were. We're not there yet, but we are not what we were. And that should produce in us humility and a deep adoration for the grace of God and a desire for him to get glory. So I want us to think about this over the next few weeks. I want you to think about the fact that you have a new verdict, and I want you to think about the fact that you are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. I want you to think about God's work in your life, and I want you to think of how all of this is because God has loved you with great compassion and has sent his son to provide these things for you. He gives us the new birth, he gives us the new verdict, he gives us the new transformation, and so let's draw near to the light and in humility and in admiration for God, let us be eager 
for God to get his glory for all that he has done, for all that he's doing, for all that he will do in us and through us in his great work of Christ's salvation of sinners.